بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة بن الحسن العسكري فداه وأرواح العالمين It's great to be back الحمد لله in the presence of, of these luminous faces these brothers and sisters in faith Here's a question that I'm sure every once in a while we'll all be asking ourselves regardless of my level of faith, regardless of how pious I am, I'm sure that at some stage you'll be asking yourself this question. Why is my dua not being answered? Why are my invocations, my prayers not receiving the undivided attention of God that I so eagerly expect. The reason we ask this question at some point or another is because at the end of the day, as people who believe in God, people who subscribe to the religion revealed to the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will always find ourselves in a position of trouble, of difficulty, of inconvenience. It's bound to happen. In fact, the more you believe, the more you will have to suffer. The more hiccups along the way, the more car breakdowns, the more problems at school, in the family, with your wife, with your husband, with your children, with your parents. There's always going to be problems. In fact, the more you believe, the more you will encounter them. There's a reason for that, which I don't want to get into tonight. And it's a very, very interesting discussion as to why believers have to suffer more than non-believers. Why the hadith says, Ad-dunya sijnul mu'min wa jannatul kafir. This world, this lowly life of ours, is like a prison for a believer and a paradise for a non-believer. Right? It's a very, very elaborate, very deep kind of discussion that hopefully inshallah will get the chance to address at a future point. But what I'm trying to address tonight is how we, when, when faced with these afflictions, when faced with tribulations and problems, which happens every single day, there's no escape from these tribulations. Not a day passes without you experiencing some kind of discomfort. Think about it. Maybe starting tomorrow, do a little experiment and see if you can go through the 24-hour period without a single discomfort. It's bound to happen. And when faced with these tribulations, sometimes there are those whose belief is so weak that God is a last resort for them. It's almost like someone getting diagnosed with a terminal disease, God forbid, an aggressive form of cancer, right? And they'll start by, you know, they go through the five phases of denial, shock, acceptance, etc., etc. They go to doctors, they pay, you know, specialists, they consult the best physicians around the world, they do whatever they can to try and cure themselves, to try and treat the problem that they have. And when doctors give up on them completely, that's when they say, now let's go to Karbala and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the grace of Imam al-Hussein to help me. The question is, why is it that God was the last resort? Why is it that His door is the last one to be knocked? If I have a little more faith, sure I need to seek treatment, sure I need to consult with doctors. Nobody's saying we shouldn't do that. But at the same time, parallel to these efforts, we should also be asking God 
for help and intervention. The problem lies, as I said, some people don't even ask God until they're absolutely desperate. And faced with enough sufficient desperation, everybody's going to call on to God at some point. Everybody. Including people like Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and the most staunch atheists who've built their entire careers on the premise that God doesn't exist. And by coming up with such a, 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 a challenging mantra, they sell millions of, of copies of their books. Even these people, when faced with absolute adversity, when faced with hopelessness in the nth degree, even they will reach out to God. Even they'll say, oh my God, save me. So that's one problem. For people who don't call on to God, except at times of extreme desperation and adversity, like the Pharaoh. What happened to the Pharaoh? Have you ever asked yourself why the body of Pharaoh Ramses II has been preserved for four or five thousand years? I'm not, not so sure about the exact figure, but it's at least four or five thousand. Why has that body been preserved? So many people have come and gone, so many kings, so many emperors. Why this one? Because God, and it's one of the miracles of the Qur'an by the way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, that, and this again was revealed 14 centuries ago, God is addressing His Prophet, listen to this. He's talking to His Messenger and He says to him, He tells him the story of Moses and the Pharaoh. And then He says that at the time when Pharaoh was drowning, when he faced death and stared it right in the eyes, what did he say? Now I believe. And so what did, how does God respond to that? Actually there's a very interesting side story to this according to the narrations of Ahlul Bayt. The narration states that he appealed to Moses. Now, what's the relationship between Pharaoh and, the, and, and Moses? It's a very close relationship. Pharaoh practically raised Moses in his home. So he's almost like a father figure. So the hadith says that Pharaoh, when he, when he stared death in the eye, and he realized that there was no escape from this, he was going to die. Remember, he's being drowned in the, in, the, in the river Nile. Right? It's not a surfing accident. He's at the bottom, walking at the, at the very bottom of the river, when he's overwhelmed with water. So when he realizes that he's going to die, he appeals to Moses, his son. And he says to him, Now I believe. Save me. Moses says to him, Go to hell. After all that you've done, after all the death and carnage and plunder, killed 40,000 infants because he was told that one of them is going to rise up and, and overthrow him. Right? Very, very vile, despicable man, no question about it. But Moses, having seen all of that, having known the kind of character that this person had, he says to him, go to hell. I'm not going to help you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Moses, he says to him, had he asked me instead of you, I would have helped him. Which shows you the mercy of God. Even Pharaoh, had he asked God? So again, the point is, everybody at some point, and, and let me mention this as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that we will now, as a result of believing in God, even though believing in God at, at that point was not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it was too late, it was simply too little too late, right? But in exchange for that, that meaningless, worthless gesture of belief at a time when it's too little too late, God says, in exchange for that, I'm going to preserve your body. You will be saved through your body. In other words, you will be condemned to eternal damnation in the fires of hell. There's no question about that. But, subhanAllah, every little act, no matter how small, 
If it's a good deed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will repay the doer. He will compensate the doer. If it's a bad deed, God will punish the doer. No matter who it is, no matter how small. That's why next time you're faced with a quote-unquote small sin, quote-unquote secondary sin, Think about this. You will pay at some point, at some stage. You will have to pay. There's no question. It's the justice of God. It's a perfect, balanced ecosystem that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. No one escapes punishment. And no one escapes reward either. Perfect balance. Anyway, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, فَلَنُنَجِّيَنَّكَ الْيَوْمَ بِبَدَنِكَ We will preserve you through your body. So that you will be an eternal lesson for everyone to learn from. And that's why even today it exists. So, one major issue that a lot of people suffer from is not appealing to God, is not asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we should be asking God all the time. One hadith says, Ya Dawood, listen to this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Dawood, David, the biblical David, who was a prophet and a king, he says to him, Ya Dawood, Remember, he's a king, not just a prophet. He's got everything. Allah says to him, Ask me for anything and everything, including the salt that you put on your food. Why? Because it's a sign of servitude. It's a sign of submission. It's a sign of humility towards God. For me to ask him, and to ask him excessively, to ask Him for everything and anything. While I put in the effort to provide my own food and to provide for my own living, but at the same time I know that the ultimate source is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So, back to the main topic. Those who do appeal to God, those who do pray to Him, once in every while, they won't receive an answer. And so again, back to the question that I asked at the beginning of this talk. We're faced with a, an enigma of, of one kind or another. We're faced with a, a, a situation that's rather confusing. I'm a believer. I subscribe to this religion, to God's last revealed message. I love the Prophet. I love his family, his household, his kindred. And, I, and I'm in, in need, I'm certainly in trouble. And I'm appealing to God, I'm asking Him. But I don't get a reply. Why? And this is one of those tests that if you don't have sufficient faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sufficient knowledge about what it is that causes a prayer not to be answered, you'll break. And the worst thing, the worst thing is for people to break at that point, to abandon belief in God. I'll share a little story with you. One of the marajah, the high-ranking jurist of the Shia faith, he told me the story. He said that when I was young and I was studying at the seminary, I had a friend who was also studying, um, who was a classmate, he was studying together. And so we were very close, he says. One day I hear that he's fallen sick. So I went to visit him and, and it looked like the sickness was overwhelming him. It was, he was in a lot of pain. He says that that's, that illness was rather chronic and it took a few months. At some point I received news that he is so ill, he's leaving last instructions for his family members. In other words, he's given up hope of, of staying alive. So he says, I went to visit him. As soon as I step in his home, he says, he says, I had one foot in the door. He noticed that I was coming in. And his first words out of his mouth were, why does God punish me by having me go through all of this pain? What have I done to deserve this? Haven't you heard people say that? Traditions tell us that if you ever say that statement, if you ever utter those words, all of the good deeds that you've done will be wiped absolutely clean. All the good things that you've done will have no rewards attached to them whatsoever. 
God forbid. Why? Because when you say, why does God do this? What, what did I do to deserve this? And essentially what you're saying, God forbid. I hope no one will ever say this. Even if by mistake somebody said that in the past, make sure it doesn't happen in the future because now you know what it means. When someone utters those words, essentially what they're saying is that God has oppressed me. God is unjust and He's doing to me what is not deserving of me. Right? So the implications are absolutely huge. It's a very, very difficult test that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes some people go through to that to the capacity that they have. Anyway, so he says that, my friend said, what have I done to deserve this? He says, I was shocked, obviously. I didn't expect this from him. He's a student of the seminary. He's supposed to be a alim one day. He says, so I, I restrained myself. I tried not to react in a way that would... Be. I, I, he said, I thought to myself, he's sick. He's going through a lot of pain. He might say stuff like that. So I better not say anything bad to make the situation even worse. He says, I walked in, I sat next to him. And I said to him, you know what I think? I think you'll be fine. You'll be just fine. And he told me, he said, the reason I said that to him is because I thought he's being tested by God. Now that he's failed the test, God will no longer continue to test him. He's failed it. And once you've flunked, a class, once you flunk the course, there's no reason to continue doing it, right? And so he says, what do you mean? I said, no. Oh, I'm just saying, I'm just saying that you'll be just fine. He says, that story occurred 40 years ago. This man is still alive. Every once in a while he comes to visit me. Of course, he abandoned the house that he abandoned the seminary. But every once in a while he comes to visit me. He sits there in that corner. He doesn't utter a word about that incident. I never raised the issue as well. We pretend like it never happened. He failed the test. So, if someone asks, someone prays, and they're not answered, we have multiple options. The first option is like this man to abandon faith and to blame God, God forbid. The other option is to blame myself. Is to find out what it is about dua that I didn't do. What, where did I go wrong? Let me share a hadith with, with you which is absolutely beautiful. One day, a companion comes to visit Imam Sadiq He sits down and he says to him, Ya Rasulullah, ayatan fi kitab Allah, la a'lamu ta'wilahuma. There are two verses in the Quran that I simply don't understand. I've tried, I've tried to make sense of them, but I simply can't. The Imam says to him, what, what are those two verses? He says, the first verse is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ud'uni astajib lakum. Call on to me and I shall answer. He says, I don't understand that verse. Because a lot of times I pray, I don't hear an answer. My affliction, my problem, my pain doesn't go away. Sometimes it even gets worse after I pray. So I don't understand this verse. He says, what's the second one? He says to the Imam, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَنْفَقْتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Whatever you give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, يُخْلِفُهُ وَهُوَ خَيْرُ الرَّازِقِينَ Whatever you give in the way of Allah, Allah will replace it. You give charity, a hundred dollars in charity, Allah will give you a hundred dollars in exchange. So you won't lose your money. He says, I don't understand that verse because a lot of times I've given money in charity and I've ended up with less money than I did before. The Imam says to him, listen carefully brothers and sisters. He says to him, do you think that God would make a promise and then break it? He said, of course not, no. He said then, in other words, what the Imam is saying is that you have to establish a set of principles, things that you know. You start with what you know. I know for a fact that these are verses in the Quran that have been revealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're authentic, number one. Number two, I know that God never breaks a promise. Why? Because that would be evil. It would be vile, it would be bad, and God would never do such a thing. So we start with what we know. Once these two things are established, then we ask the question, then what's the problem? The Imam says to him, I'll mention the first part of the hadith and maybe later in the, uh, the talk, the second part. The Imam says to him, the reason when you pray, 
you don't receive an answer is because you commit sins and at the time that you're disobeying God, how do you expect Him to obey you? In other words, you have to be an obedient slave before you expect God to give you what you want. Give Him what He wants and He'll give you what you want. Number one. He says to him, as for the second verse, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that whatever, whatever you give, God will compensate. It must be given from halal sources. In other words, if your business, your source of income, whatever that may be, if it's 100% halal, the imam says that no, you don't give a single dirham, which was the prevalent uh, currency at the time. No single dirham is given without one being compensated for. In other words, you give one, God gives you one. In fact, there's a prophetic hadith in which the Prophet says that for every single dirham you give in charity, God will give you tenfold the amount that you gave. So you give one silver coin, God gives you back one golden coin. But the caveat is this. I'm using legal mumble jumble here. The caveat, the condition, is that it has to be halal. I can't go around making money from questionable sources and then just so I could feel good about myself, which is what celebrities do all the time, right? Celebrities give travel to Africa every once in a while, you know, they go for the photo op, they get pictured with little African orphans in their laps and, you know, them feeding a couple of orphans as well. And then they go back to the United States, sit down with Oprah Winfrey, they get a whole show done about it, people applauding and clapping and, you know, they get all the exposure. Why? Why? Because they feel bad about the things that they do. Their source of income is definitely questionable, if not outright haram. All the things that these actors and actresses and, and celebrities of all kinds, singers and, and composers and people of that nature feel bad. There's a sense of guilt. There's an inherent bad feeling inside their heart all the time. And the only way they can relieve themselves of that is by doing a little bit of charity. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that form of charity will never be accepted. Because the source is questionable. Because the intention is questionable. And so don't expect anything from God. You see, one of the wonderful things about charity is this. Listen carefully. I was reading an article. A study was conducted a, a few years back. Saying that giving charity in itself is one of the most rewarding things anybody could do. In other words, it's one of those sensations that gets satisfied. It's a desire that gets fulfilled. The desire to help other people. To, the feeling when you go to bed at night and put your head on the pillow and knowing that I've helped somebody. As human beings, we feel good about that. In other words, if by giving all those things that celebrities do, that billionaires do, you know, Warren Buffett gives $50 billion of his, of his, of his wealth to the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to, to fight AIDS and what have you, right? You're thinking, because I received an answer, a question the other day saying, you know, we've got some really good, really good people out there and they do a lot of good things. People like Oprah, people like Ellen DeGeneres, people like such and such. What happens to them on the Day of Judgment? Shouldn't they go to heaven? And the response is this. Number one, I don't hold the keys to paradise. I'm not going to say who goes to heaven and who doesn't. But what I will say is based on the actions that I've seen and based on the supposed intentions that I've concluded, that I've deduced, they have already received their rewards. How? Number one, by feeling good. By simply feeling good about themselves. The, the, the feeling that you've done something right. That in itself is something that's not given to just about anybody. Number one. Number two, all the exposure. The media exposure, the photo, the photo ops, the pictures, the movie deals. These are things that at the end of the day, not everyone is endowed with. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala oftentimes would give these worldly rewards to worldly good deeds. So that on the day of judgment, they don't have anything to demand. Now, 
To, to go back and, and address the question specifically, why is it that some prayers are not answered? Imam Zain al-Abidin, salatullahi wa salam, alayhi sallu ala Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. Has a beautiful hadith in which he talks about specific actions, specific sins, if you like, and transgressions that have specific implications in the physical world. Right. I gave a, a lecture series, a few, well, about 10 years ago, um, and the title was The Physics of Sin. And I talked about a lot of these sins and, and what they, what impact they leave on our lives and how they, what sort of consequences they have, right, within about 15 lectures or so. But tonight I want to focus specifically on one category of sins, one group of them, which the Imam labels as the sins which shield prayers. Or is to shield, is to block. Prayers, tahbis is to, um, uh, to 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 encapsulate, right? To put in a cage, to imprison. So the Imam says that there are certain actions that prevent people's prayers from reaching Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. We have a hadith that says, if you could only see the actions that are sent to to God. And we're talking about good deeds here. If people could only see the actions that are sent to God and then sent back with a stamp across the cardboard box that says, return to sender. In other words, the actions that have been rejected by God, if you could only see them, you'd think not a single action is being accepted. In other words, for the vast majority of the good deeds that people perform are rejected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? And, and, and again, essentially, prayers are also blocked in the same way. So Imam Sayyid al-Abidin says the following, listen carefully. He says, الذنوب التي تحبس الدعاء Number one, سوء النية Having corrupt intentions. Right? And this is a no-brainer. I think most of us will be able to understand this quite clearly. When our intentions are impure, our actions are never accepted. Never. In fact, traditions tell us that if for a second, while you're performing salat, when you're praying, if a second of that prayer is done for the purpose of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in other words, you do with it, you, 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 you throughout the prayer, there's a, there's a second that you perform so that someone will see you and think highly of you, that entire act of prayer will be thrown at the ground and not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, a single imperfection of this kind, riya, can render the entire act of worship invalid. Now scholars, I, since I mentioned this, I think it's important to also mention, uh, some ulama say that if you're praying, and a thought comes in your, in your mind, and God forbid, you offer a part of your prayer to uh, a creature other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, you do it for the pomposity, for the name, for the, you know, for the theatrical. If that happens to you, then simply correct your intention, go back to the pure original intention that you had, continue your prayers, and after you're, you're done, then you should um, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. And one way of doing that would be to perform tasbih al zahra one way of doing that would be to perform, to recite Dua Al-Faraj. And all of these uh, 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 prayers and rituals that have been prescribed specifically for um, Salat are, are, are designed to mend the imperfections, are designed to perfect the imperfections and fix the prayer that needs fixing. And I don't know about you, but every time I pray, there is definitely a lot of fixing that needs to be done to my own prayers. And so one way to compensate for that is to perform the things that, are, that we commonly refer to as taqibat, right? The things that you perform after your salah. Don't get up after you finish your prayer. As soon as you say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, you know, run and, and jump like a spring to go back to whatever activity you're doing before. Ensure that your prayer is, is mended, it's fixed, the imperfections are addressed, right? So that you, you don't leave... A, a, an act which is imperfect and that's damaged and, and you know that's useless. So remember that. 
So the Imam says that one of the problems that a lot of people have is, is imperfect or, or impure, I should say, intentions. Now, intentions aren't just about an important factor in any good deed. No, they are absolutely pivotal in the validity of any deed or lack thereof. It's all about the intention. It's all about the intention. Let me give you one example. During the time of Imam al-Rida, the Imam, if you recall, was named the crown prince. He was the heir to the throne of Ma'mun al-Abbasi. And he was forced, he didn't willingly accept that title, but it was forced onto him. And the Imam was exiled from Medina to Khurasan, to Tus. The hadith says that two uh, believers, Muslims, they decided to go and visit the Imam. So they go from Kufa, I think it was, or Medina, I can't remember. And they go to join the Imam in Tus. When they arrive, one of them asks the Imam, he says to him, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, I've come all this distance, and just to make sure, do I pray my prayers in full, or are they broken in half? Which is what you have to do when you travel, right? When, there is, when you cross a certain distance, and you get out of the city, then you have to break your prayers. The prayers that are made up of four units, that is, you break them in half. So he says to the Imam, what do I do? The Imam says to him, you must break your prayers in half, you perform them as qasa, whereas your friend has to perform them in full. He says to him, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, we came together. We've come from the same place. The Imam said to him, yes, but your intention was to visit me, your Imam, your leader, your divinely appointed successor of the Prophet. Whereas your friend's intention was to visit Ma'mun, and that renders the trip into a sinful trip. Which is something that scholars actually, they, they have rulings about this. They say that if the trip is taken with the intention of performing a sinful act. God forbid, na'udhu someone travels from one city to another to play, to, to gamble in casinos, which is a sinful act, right? Someone goes to Las Vegas. Now, some people might tell you we're going there to invite people to the truth and, you know, help a few people find the, the light of, of Islam along the way. Right? But, but the truth is, in fact, I, I, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, I once received an invitation from a group in Las Vegas to go and give a series of lectures there, which I didn't have a problem with. It's just that I said to my friend who uh, gave me the invite, I said to him, two issues. Number one, what do these people do for a living again? Living in Las Vegas? Don't tell me that they work the night shift at, at the casinos and then come to the majlis in the morning. So the, the other issue I had is, God forbid if I go there and something happens to me and I die, what are we going to write on the obituary? Sayyid Mahdi al-Mudarasi who died in Vegas? <laughs> Doesn't exactly uh, leave a good impression, no matter how much you try to explain it. But anyway, there are some good people there. But if someone decided to go to perform a sinful act, scholars say that their prayers must not be broken. They, you, they have to be performed in full. Because intentions matter. He's traveled all this way, but because he wants to see the Ma'moon, and that's his, his, it's a sinful act because Ma'moon is a tyrannical ruler, it matters. Someone by the name of Ash'at ibn Qais. I don't know if you've heard about this man, but you should. The reason is, he was one of the people who opposed the commander of the faithful so much that he'd be going around spreading rumors about the Imam, slandering the Imam. He was one of the Khawarij, if you like. Not only that, his daughter is Ju'da bint al Ash'ath ibn Qais, the wife of Imam al Hassan who poisoned him to death. His son was the one who murdered Muslim ibn Aqil al Kufa. Vicious family. I don't know what these people had for food. Whatever it was, it was just a lot of poison. And so this man comes to visit the Imam, knocks at the door in the middle of the night. The Imam opens the door, he says to him, What? This is when Imam Ali was the ruler, was the emperor. He says to him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, I've cooked you this, this beautiful, succulent, sweet, this confectionery, and I'd like you to have it. The Imam said to him, hang on a second, why? What's the occasion? Just last week someone invited me to their house. I said, what's the occasion? He said, I don't know, Easter? The Imam says to him, what's the occasion? He says to him, don't worry. In fact, historians say that whatever that was, it was beautiful. 
It was really, really tasty. It was built, it was made with the, with the highest quality ingredients, you know, things that they didn't have back then, things like saffron and, you know, olive oil and uh, uh, honey. And it smelled really good. The Imam talks about this in Hajj al He says to him, why? He says to the Imam, just take it. I just have something to talk to you about tomorrow. I'll come to the office tomorrow. I got something to discuss with you. It's a bribe. Clearly he wants to bribe the Imam because he's got some government business. The Imam said to him that the, the smell, as beautiful as that was to an ordinary person like me, the Imam said to him, that smell, it smelled like a foul stench. It was almost like a toxic fume to me. You know, it's Amir al-Mu'mineen. He's, he's been so pure for all of his life, he could smell a bribe a mile away. Just to take it. Because intentions matter. Intentions are important. Traditions talk about how if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a beautiful hadith actually. He says, Ana khayru sharik. Imagine if you have like two partners, right? Usually if it's a partnership, it's a 50-50 partnership, right? Unless they have a different kind of agreement. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if you ever ascribe a partner to me, if you ever do something for both God and whatever else you want to fill in the blanks with, if you partner someone else with me, he says, I'm the best partner anyone could ever have. Why? He says, Whatever is offered for me and for my partner, whoever it is you've ascribed to me, he says, I will leave it all to the other party. In other words, I don't want it. If your prayer is designed so that you could perform your obligation while at the same time sending the message, get the, getting the word out, that, oh, here's a faithful believer. Here's a really good guy. He's, he's, he prays and he's a very good candidate and a bachelor. So if you're interested, you know who to call. If that's the intention, God forbid, and oftentimes these intentions do creep in our, in our heads. And the reason they creep into our heads is because the shaitan wants them to. That's what the shaitan does. That's his job, to mess with your head and to manipulate your intention. Shaitan can't grab your arm and pull you into sin. He can't do that. He doesn't have any physical authority over any of us. How does he deceive us then? He deceives us by manipulating intentions. Anyway, so one of the reasons people are not able to have their answers, their prayers answered is because their intentions are not pure. I'll mention one more story. One day, a, an angel asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for permission to enter the, the realm, the physical realm of the earth. Because that happens. According to our narration, sometimes it happens. Which, was, which is why you need to ensure that you never ridicule anyone who is religious and pious. No matter who they are. Never ridicule anyone because you don't know who it is that you're ridiculing. You don't know who it is that you're mocking. Could be an angel of God. And so, angels used to come down. In fact, traditions tell us that uh, the archangel Gabriel, Gabriel used to come down to the earth in human form and speak to the Prophet. In fact, he was known as Dihya al-Kalbi. And Dihya al-Kalbi is often mentioned in narrations as someone who used to come, very nice looking young man, who used to come and sit with the Prophet in private, they'd be discussing things, and people didn't know who that was, until the Prophet told them that this is in fact Gabriel in human form. One narration even says that one day he was talking to the Prophet, Abu Dhar walked past, and Abu Dhar didn't want to, I don't know what the reason was. He probably didn't want to um, interrupt the conversation or, uh, or distract the Prophet. So he just walked past them. So the uh, Jibra'il says to the Prophet, he says to him, had Abu Dhar offered us his salams, I would have responded. Jibra'il would have responded to him. Anyway, so this angel asks God to come into the physical realm. God gives him permission. He just wants to observe human beings. Imagine if we had like, you know, extraterrestrial intelligent life forms, aliens, they'd want to know how humans think and what they do, these primitive carbon-based life forms that we are. So he comes down and the tradition says that he goes to a town and he notices a man walking up to a door. And he walks up to this house and he starts knocking at the door. This angel who's in human form, anthropomorphic, 
he goes up to him and he says to him, I just out of curiosity, why are you knocking at this door? He says to him, I'm visiting my friend. He says to him, why, do you need anything from him? He said, no, I'm just here and he's a, he's a good friend of mine. He's, he's a God-fearing, God-believing man. And I wanted to pay him a visit. So the angel says to him, I swear by God that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that if anyone visits a believer, a woman visiting another woman, a man visiting another man who, who have nothing to offer aside from the fact that they are believers, that they're faithful men and women. The hadith says if someone visits them for the sake of God, it is as though they are visiting God himself. How amazing is that? By the way, we have a hadith that one who visits Imam Hussein every Thursday night, kana kaman zar Allah is like one who visits God at the very top of his throne. And, and, and I've, I've seen some people having a problem digesting this hadith. Visiting Imam Hussein is like visiting God. Well, here's another hadith that says if you visit a believer, an ordinary believer, it's as though you have visited Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Intentions matter. You know how sometimes people say, you know, let's go to that gathering. Let's go to that majlis. Let's go to that place. So and so's house. Why? If you ask yourself why you're going, most of the time, it's got nothing to do with God. In fact, it is based out of these impure intentions. I will go there so that they will come to my gathering. Let's go to that mosque so that they would come to our mosque as well. So not to please God in any way, shape, or form, just a marketing strategy. That's all it is. A market. And I'm not saying marketing is, is a bad thing to do when it comes to religious things, but your intentions have to be pure, brothers and sisters. Or to boycott someone. Why would you boycott someone? And this happens especially between believers. Especially between those, those people who go to mosques and Hussainiyat and so forth. They boycott each other, they fight each other. I mean, of all the fights that we could be having, of all the fun we could have fighting each other over different sorts of things, fighting each other over these petty matters is, is just despicable, it's disgusting. And I've seen it time and again. Just recently I've been involved in a, in a major dispute between two groups, each of them trying to get access and control over a, an Islamic center. I mean, why, why? I know why. Because that's what the shaitan is designed to do. Again, as I said, there's a hadith in which uh, one companion of Imam Sadiq named Zurara. Zurara was by far one of the highest rankings of all the companions of all the Imams. One day he comes to the Imam. The Imam says, listen, shaitan has nothing to do with the other. He's got nothing to do with those people who are already deviants and who are ignorant and who have left the path of, of righteousness. God, shaitan has nothing to do with them. Then the Imam says to him, وَإِنَّمَا صَمَدَ لَكَ وَلِأَصْحَابَكَ he's, he's dedicated himself. Samada is to dedicate himself to you and your companions. He wants you and he wants you and he wants me. He doesn't want the ones who are drinking their heads off at a bar. He doesn't want them. They're already a part of his army. He doesn't want the murderers and the rapists and the liars and the cheaters. He, want the, he wants the Muslims, he wants the believers, he wants the Shia of Ahlul Bayt. And he's dedicated his entire career to them. Anyway, so that's one part of the hadith. Su'un niyya, the Imam says, al-dhunubu allati tamna'ul ad-du'a. Make sure your intentions are pure. The Prophet says in one hadith to Abu Dhar, he says, Ya Abu Dhar, فَلْتَكُنْ لَكَ فِي كُلِّ فَلْيَكُنْ لَكَ فِي كُلِّ عَمَلٍ نِيَّةٍ حَتَّى فِي الْأَكْلِ وَالنَّوْمِ Ensure that you have a good, pure intention in every little act that you perform, no matter what it is. You're trying to get out of your bedroom to go to the kitchen, come up with a good, pure intention to go along with that. You want to go to a, a drive through and buy yourself a dinner, come up with a good, pure intention to go along with that in addition to the fries. Come up with something nice. And what's amazing, brothers and sisters, and I want you to think about this when you go back home tonight, what's absolutely amazing is that you can come up with a good, pure intention no matter what scenario you find yourself in. I've talked about this in the past. Um, 
and, and scholars even mention this, traditions tell us that it's recommended to face the Qibla when you sit down. When you sit down, face the Qibla. So even in the act of sitting down, which is absolutely mundane and boring, scholars and traditions tell us that if you face the Qibla while sitting down, you get rewarded for doing nothing. For doing absolutely nothing. Eating, drinking, to find strength, to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to, 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 to get an education, to provide a livelihood for my family. A lot of, in fact, every single act, as I said, can be shifted, can be manipulated in a way where it becomes rewarding. The problem is, let me mention this as well, in the words of one of the scholars who has passed away, he says the problem when it comes to praying and performing dua and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for favors, is that imagine if you have like a satellite dish. Oftentimes the satellite dish is completely out of place. It's not facing the right direction. No matter how hard you try, no matter how much you scream at the TV set, no matter how many remote controls you break, you're not going to get an answer because you're not facing the right direction. So you have to find the truth and stick to it, number one. He says, sometimes you've got the antenna facing the right direction, facing the right satellite. But there is, you know how sometimes you get, you get mold, you get rust, you get dirt. What you need to do is to clean it. And these are what sins comprise. When we commit sins, when we do all these, even, even the little inadvertent mistakes, they're like mold that sticks to the antenna. They're like rust that blocks the ability to, to, to have a clear reception. And that's what we need to do, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. In fact, again, I'll mention the hadith at the, at the end of this talk about how the Imam says we, sh we, can, we can expect to receive answers from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of those ways is to, is to repent and seek His forgiveness, to clear away all that mold and that dirt. You wouldn't go into a, into a bathtub that has mold. You would clean it up. Why is it that when it comes to receiving answers from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we expect Him to respond no matter when, where, how, what kind of person I've been. Even little children understand that if they've been naughty throughout the year, they can't expect Santa to throw, them, throw something down the chimney on Christmas Eve. Even little kids understand that. In other words, it's a concept that we can fathom, we can understand, we can comprehend. And yet when it comes to an adult human being like myself, Going through problems, going through trials and tribulations, I expect God to respond to me no matter what I've done. That's just not fair. It's almost like the hadith that says, the dua, that we look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we perceive God, وَكَأَنَّهُ أَحْوَلُ النَّاظِرِينَ You know how when sometimes, if we're in the presence of other adults, we're usually pretty, you know, we try to compose ourselves and we don't, we don't do anything rash, we don't do anything stupid because we've got other people looking at us, right? Imagine if you have a security camera recording your every move. You ensure that what you do is, is perfect and you're like a, like a soldier in the North Korean army. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't understand these people, honestly, when they have these, you know, military... Uh, maneuvers and, and when they march it's almost like an army of robots it's scary anyway so if we've got adults observing us we're very careful what we do what we say but imagine if it's a little child like a five year old we're a bit more relaxed aren't we you know we don't mind going out of line everyone because it's a child a five year old but even a five year old understands right wrong these concepts you know, vaguely, they understand them. And so, imagine if it, if it wasn't a five-year-old, if it was like a cat or a dog. Right? People don't give a damn what they do there, right? The hadith says sometimes we treat God worse than we treat a five-year-old child. Because we do things in His presence that we would, we would never do in front of a two-year-old or even in front of a cat. We treat him as though he is, this is what the hadith says, Ahwanun Nabarin means he is the lowest of the lowest of the observers. It's like he's a nobody. Astaghfirullah. 
So, moving on. Imam Zayn al-Abidin says one of the other reasons that prayers are not accepted. لخبث السريرة خبث السريرة خبث means to be vile, to be vicious, to harbor malice. سريرة means that which is revealed, uh, uh, that which is hidden, right? In other words, the Imam is, is, is talking about the thoughts that we harbor within our spirits, the things that we don't expose to others. He says, the reason people's prayers are not accepted is because they harbor malice towards others in their hearts. You know how you have a problem with someone, and the next thing you know is that you've built this very despicable image of that other person in your head. And it's almost like every time you see them, even though you try to hypocritically smile in their face, but you hate them. You hate their guts. You want them to simply drop dead. You want a piano to fall on their head. Right? You want them to just simply be swallowed by the earth. This is what the Imam refers to as khubth al To harbor disdain, malice, hatred, spiteful intentions towards other people. He says this is one, of the, one, one type of mold and rust that blocks prayers from ever being answered. Why are not, my prayers not being answered? Look into your heart. The hate that you harbor towards other people. Sometimes I sit down and I read the things that Salafis and Wahhabis write on online, on Twitter especially, and on Facebook. And just reading it, reading it tells you how much hate these people can carry. I mean, I didn't know that a human being was had the capacity to hold so much hate within themselves without imploding. Honestly, I think someone who, who has so much hatred in their hearts, as they do towards the Shia, towards the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, I think they should, they should experience spontaneous combustion and just blow up into flames, honestly. It affects you, it affects you. And one of the effects according to this hadith is that your prayers will never be answered. Alhamdulillah, because of all the prayers that they, that they do against us, if, if, if even a one millionth of those prayers would be answered, I think every single Shia would, would be six feet under. Alhamdulillah, that's not the case. Anyway, uh, I'll wrap up with one, with one more category of sins. One more... Um, reason why prayers are not answered. And that is the Imam says, تَأْخِيرُ salat To delay prayers. And again, this is a bit of a no-brainer as well. We expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come to the rescue whenever we call on to Him. And yet when He is asking us to come to speak with Him, when He calls out, حَيَّ عَلَى الصَّلَاةِ حَيَّ عَلَى الصَّلَاةِ حَيَّ عَلَى الْفَلَاحِ حَيَّ عَلَى الْفَلَاحِ حَيَّ عَلَى خَيْرِ الْعَمَلِ حَيَّ عَلَى خَيْرِ الْعَمَلِ حَيَّ means come, hurry. It's almost like God is saying, don't come now, come whenever you want, no rush, I got all day, whatever, you know, meets your fancy. Whereas what essentially He is saying is hurry up and He says it six times. Six times. Well, it's no problem. It's not a sin to delay prayers. So let's just delay it. But don't expect Him to come rushing to your help when you need Him. Because that's how it works, right? It's like a, a joke. Uh, I, I read this somewhere and it says, God, give me patience and make it quick. <laughs> we always want a, a quick fix. We want something to, to happen right now. At the first instant. When I experience trouble or pain or tribulation of any kind, I want relief right there and then. But don't expect anything, as I said, and, and, and the hadith is very clear. تَأْخِيرُ الصَّلَاةِ حَتَّى يَفُوتَ وَقْتُهَا The Imam Zayn al says. To delay and delay and delay until it's too late. Till it's too late. I'll wrap up with this. Because we're going through a period of immense pain upon all the followers of the Ahlul Bayt and the lovers of the Prophet and his immaculate progeny. Fatima al-Zahra and her martyrdom represents the most painful and the most by far 
by far the most excruciating period in Islamic history. And what's amazing about her, without, without going into too much detail, what's amazing about Fatima al-Zahra is the only tool that she used to defend herself, to defend her husband, the commander of the faithful, was du'a. Du'a. However, the, the difference is that this type of du'a is called cursing, it's called la'na, it's called invoking the wrath of God. It's, it's another type of du'a. Some people say, you know, why do you perform la'na? And my response is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala performs la'na in the Quran. If God doesn't and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those who hurt the Prophet, Allah, those who hurt the Prophet, uh, those who hurt God and His Messenger. How could you hurt God? You can't hurt God, but by hurting His Messenger, you're hurting God. It's like when somebody hurts your child. It's like hurting you, it's no different, even worse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who do this, God will curse them. And He will prepare for them in the hereafter. A humiliating pain. And so Fatima Zahra, the way she deals with the pain that she went through, was by praying. How? I'll mention one story which I think is important for all of us to know. One day, and, and this is in fact mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, it's also mentioned in Al-Kafi, which is our book. And the reason I came across it is because I said to someone, Sahih Bukhari claims that the commander of the faithful proposed to the daughter of Abu Jah. Remember Abu Jah, the mushrik, the kafir? Bukhari says that the Imam proposed to Abu Jah. And so that enraged Fatima to Zahra and it enraged the Prophet. So the Prophet said in response to this incident, Man arafa hadihi faqad arafa. He who knows her, knows her. If you do not know her, then she is Fatima. She is my daughter. She is my flesh. She's, just, she's a part of me. So Sahih Bukhari mentions this hadith, which is famous, within the context of a, a fabricated story, a concocted scenario, that blames the commander of the faithful. So a Wahhabi once sent me a message saying, hang on a second, you have this hadith in your books. I said, where? So he showed it to me. So this is the hadith. I want to mention it to you and then explain to you how the story has been manipulated. One day a man comes to Imam Sadaq He says to him, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, is it permissible to have a funeral in the pitch black darkness of night? As soon as he said that, it's almost like he struck a chord and he reminded the Imam of something. The hadith says the Imam lowered his head to the ground for an hour. In other words, for a lengthy period of time. Then the Imam raised his head. He said, we had a mother whose name was Fatima. Again, the Imam is reminded of the tragedy that Fatima to Zahra, the daughter of the Prophet of God, the only remaining family member of the messenger, of the head of state, of the leader of 20 million Muslims at the time, would be buried at night? Shouldn't she receive a state funeral? Shouldn't every companion and every Muslim attend this funeral? So the Imam raises his head, he said, we had a mother whose name was Fatima, and then he mentions this story. He says, there was a wicked man who came to her one day. The reason I mention this hadith, by the way, one of the reasons is this. Sometimes you see a hadith which doesn't feel right. You know, the hadith, it feels like there's, there's something fishy about it. You need to make sure you don't immediately dismiss the hadith. You don't say this hadith is, is fabricated because it doesn't feel right, because this is one of those ones. A wicked man comes to the pro, to Fatima to Zahra. He says to her, Imam Ali has proposed to the daughter of Abu Jahl. So Fatima is enraged. She's filled with anger. This is our hadith, our version of the hadith. She grabs Imam al Hussein and she holds him. She grabs Imam Hassan's hand, he was a little older, and she walks out of her home. She goes straight to the Prophet's house, her father. She knocks at the door, the Prophet's not there. She realizes the Prophet is in the mosque. She rushes to the mosque, she stands at the, at the door, she doesn't enter. 
She notices that the Prophet is sitting down teaching some of his companions. She doesn't interrupt. She waits for a while. The Prophet notices her, but he doesn't want to, he doesn't interrupt his, his, his lesson either. So she leaves. After the Prophet's done, he then goes to her home, to the home of Imam Ali and Fatima to Zahra, takes his daughter's hand, carries Imam al Hassan, takes Imam al Hussein, and they all go back to his house. So far what this sounds like is a family feud, right? There's a problem between a, a man and his wife. The father-in-law intervenes, but the problem here of course is that we're talking about the commander of the faithful, Fatima to Zahra, and the messenger of Allah. So bear with me. Then, in the, in the meantime, Imam Ali comes back to his house. His wife's missing, his children are gone, he doesn't know what's happening. So the only thing he does is that he goes back to the mosque, he takes some sand, and he creates a, a pillow out of it, and he falls down, he rests his head against the sand, and he sleeps. In the middle of the night, the Prophet takes Fatima to Zahra, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, and he goes back to the mosques, mosque. The hadith says he sees Amir al he wakes him up. He says, Ya Ali, wake up. For you have awakened many, many people in the past. Again, you hear this and it, and it, and it, it sounds like the Prophet is, is speaking to the Imam in a very negative, very harsh way. So he wakes him up and he says to him, go to the house of Abu Bakr and the house of Umar, wake them up, get them here, no matter what they're doing, I want them here immediately. So the Imam rushes to the house of Umar and Abu Bakr, he brings them to the mosque, where there's a family feud kind of scenario, Abu Bakr and Umar, for all they know, this is what's happening. And so they come, in their presence, the hadith says, the Prophet looks at the commander of the faithful, and he says to him, مَنْ عَرَفَ هَذِهِ فَقَدْ عَرَفَ وَمَنْ لَمْ يَعْرِفْهَا فَإِنَّهَا فَاطِمَةُ بِنْتُ مُحَامَّدُ صَلُّوا عَلَى And then he says, whoever hurts her has hurt me. Whoever pleases her pleases me. This incident, they wake up in the morning again. Guess who spreads, gets the word out? Guess who goes around telling everybody about what had happened last night? It's Umar and Abu Bakr. They were the witnesses. And so you start thinking about this hadith. Do you know where it starts to make sense? At the very beginning, when the Imam says that a wicked man came to Fatima and he told her that Imam Ali had proposed to the daughter of Abu Jah. Who is that wicked? Who's this mystery wicked man? Why is the Prophet even, why is the Imam even talking about someone coming and bringing this news and then addressing him as the wicked man, as the evil man? And why, if it's a family feud, if it's a problem between a, a husband and his, a man and his wife and the father in law, why bring in Abu Bakr and Umar? Is it because, is it because, and I'm just speculating here, thinking out loud, that one of, one or two or, or both of them were in fact that wicked man who went to Fatima to Zahra to lie to her about something Imam Ali had not done. The reason Fatima to Zahra would be enraged is not at Imam Ali, but at the wicked man for spreading these rumors. But then what happens in an amazing display of genius by the Prophet and the Imam and Fatima to Zahra is that somehow the story is, is portrayed as a family feud. Somehow, they give the impression that, that Imam Ali is the one who is at, at fault here, thus ensuring that the word gets around, that the story is spread, and it's spread by none other than Umar and Abu Bakr. Why is this important? Because Fatima to Zahra, again, fast forward a few years, Fatima to Zahra is lying in her deathbed. Umar and Abu Bakr knock at the door. The commander of the faithful opens the door. They say, Ya Ali, we are here to visit your ill wife and to ask her for forgiveness. Now, someone might say, well, what did they do? Well, don't talk to me. Don't consult our books. Consult Sahih al-Bukhari, who says that Fatima died while she was angry at Abu Bakr. And guess who narrates this hadith? Aisha. And it's in Sahih al-Bukhari. Matat Fatima. Remember this next time you have a debate with someone. Matat Fatima wahya wajida ala Abi Bakr. Wajd 
is anger mixed with pain. It's not just anger. It's anger and emotional pain. So the, the Imam goes to Fatima to Zahra. Ya Ibnata Rasulillah, Omar and Abu Bakr are here at the door. They want to ask permission to come in. She says, no, I won't give them permission. So he goes to the door. He says, he, he conveys the message. They say, Ya Amir Ya Ali, please ask her, plead with her. He goes back inside. Listen, a bee, she's Fatima to Zahra. She's the daughter of the Messenger of Allah. And yet her obedience to the commander of the faithful is unbelievable. Because they asked Imam Ali to intervene and to act as a, an intermediary, the Imam goes to her and she says, and he says to her that they insist to come and see you. She says to him, Al Baytu Baytuk. It's your home, and I am but your wife. You do as you wish. They come inside. As soon as they come in, they say, Assalamu alaikum ya binta Rasulullah. Do you know what she does? She does not respond to the salam, which is an obligation if it's a Muslim. That's all I'm going to say. She does not respond to their salam. Do you know what she does? First, she says, the, the hadith says, they sat, she was facing one direction, so they sat where they'd be facing her. As soon as they sat, she called on to Fidha. Ya Fidha, come and help me roll over to the other side so I wouldn't be facing them. I get a lot of lessons here. Number one, she doesn't want to face them. Number two, she can't roll over herself. She needs help to do that. What have they done to her ribs? She asks Filpa. Filpa helps her to roll over. They get up, they move to the other side. Look at the audacity. They move to the other side. They sit down to face her. She asks Filpa again, Filpa, come and help me roll over so I wouldn't be facing them. She rolls over to the other side. Then she says, Ya Ali Salhuma. Oh Ali, ask them a question. In other words, she said, I don't want to talk to them. But I have a question to ask them. Ya Ali, ask them about that night when my father sent you to get them so that they would act as witnesses to that incident. Do they remember what my father said? They said, yes. Naam ya bint Rasulullah. They couldn't deny it. They were the source. Everybody knew. Do you remember that night? Yes, we do, Ya bint Rasulullah. Do you remember what my father said? Yes, we do, Ya bint Rasulullah. Do you remember that my father said, whoever hurts my daughter hurts me. Whoever angers her hurt angers me. Yes, Ya bint Rasulullah. Then again, to go back to the topic of dua, she raises her hands towards the heavens. Allahumma fashhad. Oh Allah, bear witness that these two have angered me. Oh God, bear witness that these two hurt me. And by angering me, they have angered the Prophet. And by angering the Prophet, they have angered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not getting out of line. All I'm doing is conveying what is already in our books and their books. It's important, brothers and sisters, for us to know these things. Because, why is it important? Because Imam al-Baqir says, he who does not know the afflictions and tribulations that we went through. Does it matter if we, if we know what happened to the Imams? Of course it matters. If my father, God forbid, if my mother had been killed, does it matter if I, if I, if I investigate the reason, the causes, the culprits or not? Of course it matters. What are people going to tell me if I said, no, I don't want to know, it's not important. Oh, they were all good, they all got along, they were all good companions of the Prophet, they all loved each other. Sure, they killed each other, but they loved each other too. What are people going to say about me? The Imam says that he who does not know what we went through and the afflictions that we suffered from is a partner to the ones who brought those afflictions to us. In other words, we become partners to the enemies of the Prophet if we simply don't know. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us, to illuminate our hearts with knowledge, with understanding, with wisdom, and with the guidance to follow in the footsteps of Fatima to Zahra, to defend her no matter what the cost might be, to protect the Ahlul Bayt and their message, 
no matter what we have to sacrifice in exchange for that. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of the avenger, to the reappearance of the imam, the only one capable of avenging the pains that Fatima to Zahra suffered from. The one whose name she called out when she was being crushed between the wall and the door. Ya Mahdi Adrikni, Fatima to Zahra said. Her 12th descendant and his name is being invoked because of the immense pain that Fatima to Zahra is going through. Let us all rise and, and pray for his safety and his hasty reappearance, inshallah. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Allahumma kun li waliyika al-hujjat ibn al-hasan salawatuka alayhi wa ala abai fi hadhi al-sa'a wa fi kulli sa'a waliyya حافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصل اللهم على محمد وآله الطاهرين